The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Welcome to worship. It's the second Sunday after Pentecost. Our, our pyramids have changed from, from red to white to green. It's the color of growth. It matches all the green that's emerging on our campus. And we are eager to step into this season of church life. It is a time to receive the presence of the Holy Spirit to give glory to God and to, and to draw closer to Christ and also to recognize uh, human need and to remember the, the story and the power of redemption and also align ourselves with divine purpose in this time and place. The food drive uh, happened again uh, this week. Um, Many from the church came with, with food contributions and, and money that the food pantry can, can use to buy what's needed there. But then also from the neighborhood, uh, just responding to the, to the words and the invitation and the sign, uh, came and participated too. So we praise God for that and look forward to the same kind of gathering that we can offer the neighborhood in July. I also want to thank you for your kind comments and encouragement that some of you have left in different places on the internet where you might have accessed this worship service. Uh, we do read and listen to those things because we, we want to learn and we want to make this more effective. Um, and we, we pray that, that, uh, that you also uh, will see that as, as a ministry of the Holy Spirit working through those who have been participating in this worship service. Specifically, Jean and Ed are going to lead us to the throne of grace with prayer and a reading from Psalm 36. Welcome to worship. Let us begin with prayer. O God of hope, you sit beside us when we are worn down and troubled. When we search for leadership like sheep Without a shepherd, you are there. Your faithfulness endures. Teach us to be quiet, to listen for your spirit's insight in these days of doubt and disequilibrium. Point us to Jesus, who gave his life to restore our peace with God. Make us aware of our sins. Guide us as we unravel systems of injustice so that we might be right with you and each other. Call us away from the comfort zones of the past to a new vision of the future where you are waiting and welcoming us with gifts and dreams beyond our expectations. We praise you with grateful hearts and with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Reading from the Psalms, chapter 36, verses 5 through 10. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save human and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! All peoples may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35 through chapter 10, verse 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve disciples. First, Simon, known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Ephesus, and Tadus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of you have told me that in your experience with Scripture, there's often uh, one word that kind of grabs you. Uh, sometimes you've read the text many times in your life, and, and here, for some reason, there's a word that gets your attention in a, in a striking, deeper way. Uh, that happened to me when I was reading Matthew 9, verses 35 through chapter 10, verse 8. We've heard that text, and uh, what word do you think arrested my attention? No, no, no. You're all wrong. The word was harassed. That really got my attention. I remembered how my sisters and I would... Uh, would visit uh, Grandma and Grandpa Meyer this time of year, and uh, we would go out into the chicken yard and harass the chickens. We thought that was great fun. Uh, uh, first of all, we would chase them this way and then that way, and then, and then we had the idea where well, we could split up and then come at them from different directions. Um, that was a lot of fun until Grandma saw what we were doing and came out, her apron flying and said, you kids, you kids, get away from those chickens. You're upsetting them. They're not going to lay any eggs. Well, we did. We left them alone for a while, but we had a conference and thought, well, that was so much fun that maybe, maybe tomorrow we'll try harassing. We didn't use that word, but that's what we were doing. We'll go out and chase Grandpa's cows. He had eight to ten cows that, uh, that he milked and... Uh, um, uh, and then sometimes they would come up pretty close to the house in their pasture there. And uh, we thought, well, those chickens were so much fun to frighten and they would make such gobbling noises. And imagine what the cows would do as they gallop off when we start chasing them. Well, it's a different outcome with that part of the, uh, of the story. The next day we did, we snuck up on the cows and, and we frightened them and we started to harass them. Uh, they backed up about five feet and then they came toward us. And there were different sounds as we hightailed it back to the fence and tried to get over before those cows, especially that one real bossy brown one, I remember, that she really wanted to know why we were hassling them. I think she was the queen of the herd. Uh, we felt what it was like to be harassed and also helpless because those cows were really big as they were chasing us and I'm sure that their breath was the hottest thing and, and we barely got over that fence. 
harassed and helpless. It's what uh, flips Jesus' stomach in this story in Matthew. Compassion. Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It is a, a text, a story about, about the compassion of Jesus as he was revealing in Matthew's story that in fact he was full of God and that he was starting to teach and proclaim and heal because God was in him and using him that that was another sign really that God was in him. Compassion. It's a New Testament word for what turns up in the psalm and in many places in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, hesed is the word. Hesed. It means loving kindness. It means steadfast love. Any translation that you look for, hesed usually has a compound word. There's, there's not one word that can, that can summarize it. And even there are many that uh, choices that translators have made, and some of them come kind of close mercy, but yet it's more than that. It's steadfast love. It's love that is constant. It is love that is at the very identity of God. And now in this text from, from Matthew, we realize this is the very identity of Jesus. And so that as, as we read this text and we realize what, what uh, Jesus is doing here, what Matthew wants us to know as, as a prelude to selecting the disciples and, and launching the mission of the good news, um, here he is revealing his activity himself, the teaching and the preaching and the healing, but most of all, the compassion. Literally, his stomach, his bowels flipped at the harassed and helpless crowd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. It's a call that comes down through the ages and all those who, who follow Jesus and model our lives after Jesus' actions find that, that the Holy Spirit, as it comes to us, has that kind of an effect. We should expect that, that we will find our hearts broken by the thing that break God's heart. We will find our own compassion unequal to the task, and, but, yet, but yet funded with deep compassion, more hesed coming from God's own self, and then amazed that there would be that kind of grace that would come into our lives, not for our own, our own fulfillment, which is, which is worthy, um, or even for our own credit, but for, but for the sake of the world, especially the crowds that are harassed and helpless. Through the ages, the, the church has countless witnesses of how people have responded to that. Very early it became a, an identity mark of the Christians, people of the way. They were the ones that, uh, that cared for the sick and the dying during a pandemic. They were the ones who, uh, who, who looked after the, the, the old, who were abandoned. They were the ones who, who took care of prisoners and slaves. And uh, usually without, without any pay. No emperor hired them to do that. Emperors didn't have that kind of compassion. But out of the goodness of their art, out of the hesed that dwelled in them, they extended themselves to those crowds. Basil, one of the church fathers, established um, communities even that, uh, that had something like, uh, like we would call hospice um, units, buildings, that, uh, that those who were in the last days and sicknesses of their lives perhaps would, would, uh, would spend their, day with, their days with, with care. Um, infirmaries and, and these, uh, these areas would be known as basiliads. Uh, they, were, they were the beginnings of what we would know as, uh, as a hospital unit that has clinics and something that, uh, 
that a person would go to if they had sickness or symptoms that caused them concern. In due time, Charlemagne, uh, one of the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, years later, decreed that every, every church, every basilica, would have an attachment that would be an infirmary, and in that the nurses and the caregivers, the, the doctors in the community, could use that to take care of people. Coming to church was also a mission to being made well through the doctors, the infirmaries, and whatever kind of medicine was the extent of their ability and their knowledge at that time. William Berry, William Berry writes about the importance of health as a mission of the church. It's another extension of this text about compassion and in the way that the, the sickness and the and the needs of the people, uh, the harassment, the helpless, flip Jesus' stomach. He said that, uh, that health comes from the, the same root word as, as wholeness, holy also. It's all from the same, same root word. So, so we need to re-embrace that as part of what it means to be whole and also to be holy. Now we have to admit that there's not much that we as human beings can do to, uh, to do the holy part. Maybe we can do quite a bit when it comes to, to health or even, even wholeness to take care or be aware of the different dimensions of our lives when they're, they're out of balance or when one part is, is sick and ill and it affects everything else. But the holy part, that's part of health, but that's God's work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit working in and through us to bring about redemption of our souls, our sinfulness, to bring about that which only God will and can heal. The choir is going to sing a song for us now. It's based on a text from Jeremiah 46, 11, uh, where, where Jeremiah uh, it says in an oracle, go up to Gilead and get some balm. Get some balm for that illness that nothing else can heal. It's kind of a mysterious reference, but, uh, uh, but in the preaching of, of, the, of the church, uh, that became a spiritual. And um, uh, let's listen to it together. There is a balm in Gilead. Uh, the stanzas are important too. I want you to notice what they're about.
Well, thank you, choir, for uh, rendering that song to us. There is a balm in Gilead. Uh, did you catch the stanzas? If you cannot pray like Peter, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say, He died for all. And then, there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. It's one of those things that caught the imagination of, uh, of, a, of a person and then a whole community as they, as they heard that little snippet about there was a balm in Gilead that will heal something that, and no one else, no thing, nothing else can do that. You need to go there and find that. It was a way that they were talking about, about the healing power of God in Jesus. You see, we find out that as, as Jesus is, is seeing that the crowds, you and I and people in general and then individually too as they are scattered and harassed, are, uh, are, not, uh, are not doing that because of their own free will but because they don't have a shepherd. And he is willing to be their shepherd. He is aware of human need. He is aware of the redemption that God offers. He is aware of the divine purpose that is behind it. Let's look at Romans 5. This is an important text for this Sunday too. I want to take a little closer look at it as we, as we think about the Apostle Paul. Remember, he was the one that was lifted up in that anthem as one who could really preach. This is what he really wrote. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Four, while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, there we heard it again. It's the chesed of God, the loving kindness, the steadfast love, the mercy of God. Paul has experienced that in his own life, in his own conversion, in his, his own mission that he's undertaken with his abilities, responding to the call that has come to him. And now he is writing to this, this group of Christians in Rome, a church that he did not establish, but yet he is hoping to go there and make it a, a base of further mission that would extend to the West, maybe as far as Spain. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, that he's talking at the right time Christ died for us. God proves his love for us in that death. And none of us merit the death of Christ. None of us can say to God, well, it's about time, I'm worth it. No, all of us are humbled, even struck, struck dumb. Maybe even our stomachs flip to think about someone dying for us, much less the perfect Son of God, God's own self, choosing to sacrifice himself for our sin. For all that is a barrier between us and that intimate relationship that God has had in mind for us all the time, all that is between us and, uh, and the call that 
that God wants to make upon us in following Christ to not only love the things that, that God does, but also do the things that God does. We just don't need to have an emotional experience. We need, we need a power from, from the divine that would enable that to happen. Something that would be so transforming that we would be eligible to hear that call and to respond as, as a vessel of the Holy Spirit, God working in us and through us. We're going to hear the, the hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God Now. It's an old hymn, and maybe you know it, I hope so. Again and again, four different stanzas start out, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It connects us with the text that we've heard in the last few Sundays about Jesus breathing on the disciples and, and saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. But it also goes a step further that we would not only love the things that God loves, but do the things that God does. We have a wonderful example before us in, in, the, in the first part of Matthew. And there's the response that follows now in chapter 10 that we heard. Uh, Jesus says, pray, pray for laborers that the under-shepherd might be helped with the crowd that is harassed and helpless. And it seems like the disciples agree to pray, but then are maybe a little surprised when Jesus says, Now you go. I am sending you to care for these people, to care for the, the sick, the lame, the blind, to care for the harassed and helpless. As God is your anchor in your relationship to me, as I am becoming the Lord in your life, you will find a security and a power. You will find a fulfillment and you will be part of the mission that I intend to fulfill. Listen to this song. Sing along, hum along. It's more than a performance and entertainment. Uh, it's a call, a prayer. I invite you to make it yours today. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love whatever you love and do what you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with you I will, one will, to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, so that your will is mine, until this earthly part of me close with your fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with you the perfect life of your eternity. It's such a tangible, common thing, isn't it? Breath, breath, breathe on me, breath of God. It's really stunning to think about God having breath and think about our breath, it is life. God breathed into his creation the breath of life. 
And really, our life with the Holy Spirit is life itself. And I trust that you can receive the call of God anew in this Pentecost season to respond as God knows your own situation to make you healthy and whole and also holy. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. you.